Like, I'm the person that I used to see other people be. People always assume that we can't or that we don't, and they're surprised by it. It's important to give voice. This piece has done what great pieces do in that it becomes about the greater humanity that we are supposed to be a part of. What kind of story do I leave? What kind of legacy do I leave as well? I feel like we are in the Harlem Renaissance, the sequel. Yes. I decided to write an African-American Requiem because I felt like I wanted to do more as an artist. In 2016, I was doing a lot of singing and the political climate was shifting in a way that didn't align with my own values. And I was, honestly, I was just worried. And for me, Nina Simone is somebody that I greatly admire. And she says, it's the artist's duty to reflect the times. I decided to break out that voice. Hello, I'm Dr. Renee. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and I am a poet and have a small narration piece as part of the African American Requiem. And these folks who are joining me on stage are coming from all different parts of the country. And so we'd like to just, first of all, start by having them tell us their names, where you're from, where you're flying in from. I am Damien Jeter, composer and singer, um, originally from Petersburg, Virginia, and I live here in Portland. I am Bill Eddins, I'm conductor and pianist, and I flew in from the great uh, Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Hello, I am Brandy Inez Sutton, originally from Huntsville, Alabama. I flew in from Manhattan, New York. I'm Carmisha Peak. <laughs> I am a singer uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, originally, but I flew in from New Rochelle, New York. Hey, my name is Bernard Holcomb, and I live in the Bronx, New York, but I am a proud Detroit, Michigan native, uh, and I'm an actor and a singer. I am Kenneth Overton Baritone, originally from the great city of Philadelphia, and I am a singer and artist advocate. My name is Henri. I'm from Portland, Oregon, so I haven't come too far. <laughs> but uh, I do film and music. Um, I'm a crossover artist and uh, an educator as well music tends to make people very emotional. Mm -hmm. And so I want to check in with the folks here on the panel and talk about what moves you most about participating in the African American Requiem. For me, it's, um, it's an honor to have been asked to participate in something so monumental and something that will debut itself to the world at this time in our society. I think it's also my responsibility as a Black man that is an artist to use my voice and platform to celebrate works such as this. So for me, it was a no-brainer. It was a, an immediate yes to um, a call to action, not just to perform, not just to sing beautiful notes and meaningful words, but it's action. So that's, it, it means the world to me to be able to participate in what I think will become one of the greatest pieces in the classical music canon. All right. No pressure. <laughs> so when you, when you talk about a, a call to action, what do you want people, how do you want people to act? What do you want them to do? I want them first to listen and to be open to receive, right? So I, I consider myself to be a vessel. For me, the gift comes from God, and then it is used through me to touch whomever it's supposed to touch. Whomever it touches and however it touches them is really none of my business. I'm just the messenger. And so I want people to gather to receive whatever it is they need to receive in that moment. Yes. 
I can say what I would like them to do. I would like them to dismantle every system of oppression that doth so easily beset us. It is quite the challenge being black in America. And I don't even know how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> like surviving each day is a testimony <laughs> of sorts because of the lived experience of black people in America. And for me, this piece allows for the opportunity to heal something that's hurting, that's broken, whatever it is for each person. It's like uh, a salve almost, like there is a balm in Gilead and that's what's being applied through music, through uh, poetry, through the arts. And that seems like our only hope sometimes is the music and what we pull from it that heals us um, in this broken world. I'm so, I'm so glad that you mentioned the word healing. Mm -hmm. oh. And so any of you can, can chime in here, but I want to make sure that that point is made, that when, when as Black people are participating in this, right, are we experiencing a different type of healing than others in the audience who, who don't have that lived experience? Yeah, I mean, and we, we honestly haven't ever had a chance to heal mm in many ways, and we haven't had a chance as a community to heal um, because our wounds have not been acknowledged for what they are, um, and we're expected to keep going and keep pressing and keep doing, but this is a moment um, where we can take a moment um, collectively and, uh, and do, do the work of healing. So we're, we're in Portland. Oregon, where the uh, percentage of black people is about 6%. So we're thinking about who is in the audience, right? And so um, there is going to be a different response, right, between the black folks in the audience and the white people in the audience. And, and how, how would you recommend white folks who come um, to not have this, I'm so sorry, kind of response. Everybody is different and everybody is going to receive this differently. And I don't think I would want to actually recommend what I want somebody to take away from it because humanity is so different and because everybody has different thoughts and reactions. And maybe everybody won't come in feeling like, I'm so sorry, you know, maybe that won't be the case. But it does start with humanizing yourself and feeling like this person next to me is my brother or my sister, no matter the color, race, religion, whatever. I mean, personally, one of the movements I sing, we are living in communities that are like war zones. The words were by Jamelia Land, I hope I'm saying her name correctly. And when I read about her, her and her story, that for me was educational. You know, I didn't grow up in a community that was like a war zone. So I didn't understand that, even as a black person. And when I read those words and heard her story, for me, that was like, wow. That even for me taught me something, you know, that my black brothers and sisters are going through and I didn't know. You know, I mean, I know, but I don't know because I haven't experienced it. And so this is what I will take away from it. But I don't really want to put on anybody else what you should take away from it because everybody's different. You know, it may just affect us to where we're like more open-minded, more loving. It may just be, let me hold the door open for this person that I wouldn't have normally held the door open for before hearing this work. You know, it may not be this drastic change that is going to happen from it. We hope. But it may be little things, and baby steps are important, too. I think it's an important point that you made, that even though we're all Black folks, that we all have different experiences. And so I'm wondering of, of you all in the room, um, how has this, the singing of it, or the participation in this, how has it affected you up to this point? I feel extremely honored and grateful to be a part of this piece and to be invited by Damien to be a part of it because as an artist, you know, everyone has different callings in their life. And my calling is to sing or to act or to be on stage. So I'm not necessarily on the ground. I'm not necessarily in the riot, but I can use my talent and my gift to put this piece out 
into the world. So this is my part. I can own that. And it makes me walk a little bit taller. It makes me feel like I can wear my crown a little bit straighter knowing that I have an opportunity as an artist to give back and to help educate someone and to help them get to the point where whatever it is that I think the beauty of the nature of Damien's piece is that everyone can ha experience it and have a different reaction, but it's all for the good. It's all to become better, to have more understanding. From my perspective, Damien has exceeded the parameters of the piece that he was originally planning on writing. This speaks to me directly as a, as a Taoist and a humanist that Yes, the piece is called African American Requiem, but how he has managed to put it together and integrate it, especially with the Latinate text. This piece has, has done what, what great pieces do in that they are no longer just about a particular subject or a particular subsect of humanity, but it becomes about the greater humanity that we are supposed to be a part of. We also have to remember that even though, you know, it's a requiem and supposedly it's it's in honor of the dead, the the requiem text in many ways is is a text of hope, because at the end there are always the prayers that everyone shall be forgiven because they have managed to understand the struggle of everyone else and that there is the God or who, who whatever your understanding of, of uh, that being is, who will be able to provide that, that kind of forgiveness and, and, and foster that kind of forgiveness amongst people. I have found this an, uh, an incredible experience simply, you know, because of that, uh, you know, especially in today's world. We're sitting here a couple days before the premiere of this piece and over on the other side of the world, there's just this brutal conflict, which is only based on a lack of empathy, which is at the basis of everything that we that we talk about when we talk about racism or we talk about suppression of other people. It's just a lack of understanding that the person that we are doing this to is a human being. And we should not be doing this if we valued our own humaneness. Did you mean to get so deep? No, I'm I'm not a deep person. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it is important to really um, unveil our, our own humanity as participants in this. So did you, did you ever, in the process of, of writing this and thinking deeply about this, did you ever doubt yourself? Did you ever feel like, what am I doing here? Or is oh, this... all the time. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, really, it's really nice to hear people's reactions to the piece because, I, I mean, there are moments where I'm still like, is this good enough, you know? And it's not just like, is it good enough? Is it good enough? But it like, given the mission and the, the meaning behind the work, is it good enough for that? So there, there, I mean, writing the piece, sometimes it was easy and sometimes it was hard. And I think that given my lived experience as a black person in this country, some of those movements I wrote in a day, actually. And then some of them I wrote in two months. But, you know, as an artist, I think we always, you know, question our uh, abilities or like if we're good enough and stuff like that. So that, that will always be a part of me, I think. And, and I appreciate your vulnerability and in, in, in acknowledging that because it gives other people permission to stretch themselves, you know, who are maybe listening um, to to, to understand that there is, there is always some doubt because we're all human and um, we all kind of wonder, is, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. Is this good enough? Is this... So I appreciate that your um, ability to be vulnerable in talking about that process. I think that's really important. You know, for me, I think the word responsibility is huge for me as, as an artist because I feel like we are in the Harlem Renaissance, the sequel. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I look at people that I admire so much, like Florence Price, like Margaret Bonds, like Langston Hughes, like Dunbar, like Baldwin, these people who are writing 
and singing and acting and speaking what was going on at the moment. And somehow we got away from that. But I feel like through the last couple of years, we're getting back to it. And it is the responsibility of the artist, of the people who have the platform to celebrate our own, to lift up our own. There's so many amazing composers out there that, yes, make me a lot of money, but don't look like me. But it gives me great pleasure and even more pride when I can sing and can speak words that were written by people who look like me. There is a different strength. There is a different energy that happens, but it's also necessary. It is necessary for the people who gather in the audience that may or may not look like me, see and hear this music coming through a Black body written by a person that has a Black body as well. So we present this music on the same level as Brahms, as Beethoven, as Puccini, as Mozart. It's the same level of commitment, if not more. But if we take the reins and be unapologetic about presenting our own art and celebrating our own people, then it's not so much of a shock anymore. The people that gather will just gather to hear greatness. <laughs> Gather on. Yeah, I love how you talked about it being necessary. I'm, I'm wondering how you will walk um, in the world with the talent that you have and how people react and what what stereotypes that oh. it defies. <laughs> From all colors. Oh, all oh. colors. Yeah. <laughs> the major part is you don't look like what you sound like. If I close my eyes, I see something totally different. That's the biggest thing, right? Like, you're nothing but five, seven, and a hundred and something pounds. It's like, okay, 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 I get the point. You know? <laughs> That's both the superpower. I've learned to lean into that. And then also to, to realize that my voice embodies something different, embodies my spirit. And so that should come first beyond what I look like. No one ever expects to hear what comes out of my mouth to come out. And... I remember one time I took my son to get his haircut from a friend and he told his coworker, the other barber there, that I was a singer. He was like, oh, well, why don't you sing something for us? And I'm like, um, okay, sure. Because I always told myself, if anybody asks, I'll always do it because you never know who needs to hear it. And so he said, you're going to sing uh, some Mary J. Blige? And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> And I started singing Summertime, and he had to stop cutting the guy's hair, and the entire time he stared at me with his mouth hanging open. Because he was like, I was not expecting that to come out. So I love it. I, I love the X Factor. <laughs> or when we walk into a room for an audition to present our talent in front of a panel of people who usually don't look like us, they're either on their computers or they're writing, and you walk in, and then the first note comes up. <laughs> Or then the flip side, which is equally as traumatic and I think harmful, is why are you singing that white people music? Hmm. Why are you not singing gospel? Why are you not singing R&B? Why are you not rapping? Why are you not singing jazz? Because that's not my gift. God assigned that. So it, it, it comes in many different yeah. waves. There's also the other side of it. Uh, I was just in the Central Park Five here at Portland Opera. We wanted to get our nails done, and there was a lady uh, getting her pedicure, and she looked at us and she said, oh, are you visiting Portland? And we're like, yeah, it's our first time. We're really excited. She's like, oh, are you football players? Do you, do you play basketball? And we're like, no, we're opera singers. And she was like, no way, no. And so one of the guys that was with us took it as an opportunity to educate her. Well, why? Why couldn't we be opera singers? And they had a really uh, interesting conversation. And she walked away being better because she's, uh, people always assume that we can't or that we don't. And they're surprised by it, you know. You know, Martin Luther King talked about rights being um, because of the they're being unheard, right? And so uh, this piece allows Black folks to be heard. Right, but also because it is, it will stir up things that we've, we've talked about. What is it that brings you joy? What is your way of tapping 
into joy despite some of the things that are happening in society? Life is great. I mean, life is fascinating. Life is interesting. I, I am speaking from a realm of, I have a roof over my house. And I'm doing okay. For me, it's always, I go through life with a sense of wonder on a daily basis. And a lot of that has come from my background and my history in music because it has taken me to all these amazing places. It has allowed me to meet so many amazing people and it has just opened up doors that, you know, a kid from the northern suburbs of Buffalo probably would not have had. It, it's it's, it's that, that wonder, just, just watching the sun come up to me is, is amazing, but the most amazing thing is always music. And so for, for me, it's a tremendous joy to be affiliated with, uh, with Damien's piece because we get to bring this, this, new, this new thing to life and it is a piece of wonder, uh, which at the end, as I said, Requiem is, is, is optimistic that, that we will find forgiveness and so for me, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. I'm not exactly sure how I got roped into it, but I'm glad I did. Joy for me comes, I mean, obviously singing, um, but that fulfills like every emotion. If I'm angry, I'll sing. If I'm happy, I'll sing. If I'm sad, I sing. Um, so that's, that's the obvious, but being able to put my arms around my son is what brings me joy, especially when I see what is going on in the world right now. I have a black son and that could be him one day, but it gives me joy, brings me joy and hope to know that there's still a chance. He still has a chance. He's alive right now. You know, he's good right now. He's safe right now. And I mean, look where we are now from where we came 50 years ago, 50 years before that, 100 years before that. You know, it, changes have been made and I just hope and pray that changes still continue to happen, you know, so that he will remain safe and alive. And I don't wanna have to talk to him about those things that I, I feel like are inevitable that I have to talk to him about, and which is color, you know, my mom is, you know, she tells me, you can't say those things to him. Don't make it about color for him, you know? And, but sometimes I'm like, well, is it really that easy? I gotta educate him. He needs to know his history, but at the same time, in a way, I feel like I'm perpetuating it. You know, how do I let him know his history, but also don't put that seed in his mind that it's a thing, you know, color is a thing. And just be, be friends with everybody. It doesn't matter you know, what their race, whoever you gravitate towards, just be a good person to everybody. So, I mean, I, and honestly, I don't have an answer. It's still <laughs> confusing for me. I'm learning as I go, you know, as a mom, it's, there's, there's no answer. There's, I don't really feel like there's a right or wrong way. It's a day at a time, but, but that little boy is what brings me joy. Thank you for being vulnerable with us and sharing that, yes. So what is it that brings you joy mm. besides music? <laughs> Definitely music, uh, but also being myself, being my authentic self and knowing that I can show up that way with my family and my friends. I think that a lot of us have grown up in a world where we feel like we have to fit in, whether that be talking a certain way or pretending that we believe a certain thing or just existing in the world a certain way. Uh, but as I've gotten older, I've realized that it's really cool and brings me a lot of joy to just find out who is Bernard? What is he like? What does he not like? Who does he want to be? Who does he want to hang around? Uh, who does he not want to hang around? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and resting in that really does bring me a deep sense of joy. Yeah. It's good to hear the multidimensionality of the <laughs> folks in the room. What brings you joy besides music? <laughs> I love crab legs. Oh. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> I really, really do. Red crab is in season right now. Well, it this is sweater is drawn butter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing that makes me happy, and I'm saying this as somebody who is a true introvert, is fellowship. And I'm thinking about like this moment right now, like these are oh, emotions. Okay. These are like all my friends. I am the person right now that I've always wanted to be. Mm. And that, that's, that is very powerful. And I find great joy in that. Like the Oregon Symphony is playing one of my pieces. 
that's before that never happened to me you know that happened to other people and i would sit back and applaud them and be very happy for them and stuff like this but this moment and this week and this weekend is something i will never forget and it's because of everybody who is on the stage right now um so that brings me joy joy also comes from seeing my nieces and my godchildren see me go after and achieve my dreams so that they know that it's possible um so for them seeing the physical manifestation of dreams come true gives me great joy and then i would say for this particular moment joy comes because i am afforded the privilege to give voice to voices that were um silenced too soon so I take great pride and joy in singing for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and Philando Castile and Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin. It gives me joy to give voice to my ancestors whose strength just by their DNA is in me. And it allows me to stand on every stage in the world and sing. It gives me great joy to honor them every time I get to open my mouth. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, Jesus brings me joy. Yes. And um, being able to commune with the divine is something that when this world is weighing me down, that always lifts me up. Because the weight of the world and the weight of walking in this world is heavy. Sometimes, in all honesty, the, I, I don't want to sing and I can't because of what's weighing me down. But if I, if I look unto the hills uh, from whence cometh my help. And the beautiful thing about this piece is that it honors all those who were taken from us. Um, honors them and the action of acknowledging um, those that have gone before us is a source of joy as well. And um, being able, like Kitty said, to give voice. Um, it's important to give voice and important to be able to be present as yourself. Um, important to not have to second guess uh, who we are because of the color of our skin. I remember before even finding out my, about my blackness and how I navigated the world, um, I was diagnosed at the age of 10 with heart is issues. Mm -hmm. And so I had to quickly understand what my mortality meant. And so I had to go through that process of going to the hospital and wearing this huge, you know, computer on my person and having to go through through recess and doing all these things. It got really, really dark and I had to pray. I had to really try to figure out, God, I believe in you. You're either going to heal me or you're going to do or you're going to provide two hundred thousand dollars for the surgery because, you know, my mortality is being challenged. And then something began to snowball. And I began to find joy in the idea of remembrance um, and leaving something on this earth. And I'm gone that that art continues to live on and that song begins to live on through other people, you know? So that's what gives me joy. I just, I want to uh, say something in that this piece has nothing to do with me. Um, sure, I wrote it, but... I am nothing without the people who can conduct it and can sing it. I mean, it has something to do with me because I am black. So in that respect, it does. But I think that um, the notion that, you know, it's my piece and, and stuff like that feels very um, wrong. It's not the right word. But uh, I just wanted to say that I, I wrote this piece because I wanted to um, commemorate the folks who have been killed in this country. And through my love of classical music and what I know about Requiem Masses, this is the way that I wanted to do it. Um, but it really has nothing to do with me. 
So I, I, I've heard um, some of you talk about legacy that talked about ancestors. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what do we feel is our obligation to our ancestors? And is this part of um, receiving, being open Absolutely. to that energy? I mean, even I'm somebody who loves genealogy. That is something else that brings me joy. I mean, my tattoo is like the uh, flowers of the home countries of my ancestors. Um, so I am. I feel like I'm deeply connected to them through whatever way. And I do happen to know that a lot of them were very musical. I am. I am using their voice. Really, is what I'm doing through this piece. Um, and Kenny said it better than I can ever say it, but. You know, what do you say? <laughs> the stuff about the, you know the stuff about the ancestors, and you can you can stand on the stage because of their strength and all oh, this yeah. stuff. I, yeah, that is uh, resonates with me so much. You know, I the short answer to what you said is yes. I allow myself to feel their presence. I too love genealogy, and a couple of years ago, I got my DNA tested because I wanted to know. There are a lot of people who ask in interviews and such. Well, do you call yourself black or do you say African-American? And so many Americans who are black don't know from exactly where they came from. And so I wanted to know that for myself. First of all, it took me 48 hours to open the results. Um, but when I did, there was this gigantic sigh of pride and relief and release to see Ghana and Nigeria and the Ivory Coast and Benin Togo. And so from that moment, I had decided whenever I do a concert or a recital that I wear garments or fabrics or colors from one of those nations to deliberately bring them on stage with me. They allow me to stand straight, shoulders back, head held high, crown straight, and be. It's because of them. They created the spiritual, the mother music of this very country as they built it from nothing. Yes. And as Damien put in the last page of this score, is that their blood is the marrow of the soil of this country. And so as we stand here and sing this music, it is for them. It is absolutely for them. So I, I'm going to wrap the way that I do with my young people is, is um, to give a word or a phrase that really grounds you in this moment and this opportunity that you have before the actual show. Um, what is that word or phrase that is, is grounding you in this opportunity? Peace. Love. Thank you. I think for me it's remember. Humanity. Honor and legacy. I would say being um, who I've been created to be. That is rooting me. Being able to just be. <laughs> Mine is uh, lean in. Yeah. Lean into the pain. Lean into the joy, mm -hmm. lean into the nerves, lean into the community. My word is healing. Mm. And I'm so grateful that you all have joined us and that you all shared your heart and your intention for what you hope people will get out of this experience. And it starts with you all and your grounding for what's possible. So I thank you for participating in this conversation and I thank you for all the work that you've done to bring all of these folks here and for what might evolve as a result of this. And thank you for doing it. Thank you for writing. Thank yeah. you mm -hmm. for following your heart, your dreams, being brave and bold and honest and real and using the gifts that God gave you so generously to make a piece that speaks for all of us. It's, tre it's tremendous. Well, I, I appreciate that. And thank you all for making it come alive.